If it's Monday, new polling shows Vice President Harris's support and popularity on the rise in key swing states, as former President Trump accuses Democrats of stealing one of his policy proposals and faking their crowd size. Plus, the Pentagon rushing more military firepower to the Middle East, including a nuclear-powered submarine as Israel prepares for a coordinated retaliatory attack from Iran and its proxies that could come at any moment. And the Trump campaign says it was hacked and suggests Iran is to blame for leaking sensitive internal campaign documents. The incident now raising new election interference concerns as lawmakers push U.S. intel officials for more information. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Gabe Gutierrez in Washington at a pivotal moment in the presidential race. After a week-long swing through the battleground states where they were greeted by fired-up crowds, and with the Democratic National Convention now just one week away, Democrats are hoping they can maintain this momentum, while Republicans are hoping the honeymoon is over and that their candidate can stay focused. Former President Donald Trump seemingly irked by the size of the crowds greeting the newly minted Democratic ticket, baselessly claiming the crowds were fake. How about yesterday? They said, oh, she had a big crowd. Oh, the crowd, the press is talking about the crowd. In New Jersey, I had 107,000 people. The press never even talked about it. In, they don't talk about it. Right? They don't talk about it. Because they're fake. Trump repeating that false claim on social media, baselessly accusing the very real crowd at an event in Michigan of being AI generated. It comes as a new round of New York Times Siena polls in the battleground states of Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin show Vice President Harris narrowly leading former President Trump within the margin of error. It's an improvement from where President Biden stood when he was in the race, but it's Harris's popularity versus Biden's that's the big story here. Across the board in these three states, essentially half the voters have a favorable opinion towards the vice president. That same poll had President Biden hovering in the low 40s back in May. The Harris-Walls campaign right now is keeping its focus primarily on former President Trump, but did roll out a policy proposal this weekend that put her in rare agreement with Trump, ending taxes on tips. And it is my promise to everyone here, when I am president, we will continue our fight for working families of America. including to raise the minimum wage and eliminate taxes on tips for service and hospitality workers. Trump, who first proposed the idea on the trail earlier this summer, posting online that Harris, quote, copied his proposal. Meanwhile, vice presidential nominee J.D. Vance this weekend continuing the Trump campaign's criticism of Harris for not yet doing a formal sit-down interview. The Harris campaign, what are their policy views? They don't have a policy position on their website. Should she sit down and answer tough questions with you? Yes, I think she should. Absolutely. Where we're, we're, is she? The person who wants to be our president ought to sit down for some tough interviews. I'm willing to do it, and I wish she would, too. And let's turn to our NBC News correspondents covering the two presidential campaigns. Monica Alba is covering Vice President Harris, and Garrett Haig is covering former President Trump. And he's here with me on set. Thank you both so much for joining me. Monica, I want to start with you, though. The two big criticisms coming at the Harris campaign, right, their lack of concrete policy plans or differences from President Biden, and the absence of any sit-down interviews. So does the campaign feel like they need to address these soon, or are they okay to continue to keep running on what we've seen in the last few weeks? Well, it sounds like, Gabe, we're going to see the policy rollout first, and that's coming, according to Vice President Harris, sometime in the middle of this week. And I think it's by no accident that they're going to roll that out, let's say, sometime close to Wednesday. And then Vice President Harris is going to be appearing with President Biden in an official event, in their official capacity in Maryland, talking largely about lowering costs 
for Americans. But it'll come at a time when Vice President Harris does know and acknowledges that she does want to put her own agenda out there for what she would do differently if she is elected to the White House, areas where likely she will say President Biden has been successful in some ways but couldn't go far enough in others. And here's what she would propose. But as we know with all of these campaigns and with candidates, this is something that they can talk about and tout as wanting to do, but the reality of actually enacting it is a lot harder. But still, there are questions about where she stands on some of those things. So from an economic rollout perspective, that's likely to come first. And then in terms of your question about an interview, she has been taking a couple more questions just briefly in gaggles with reporters as they were traveling the last couple of days. But she is hoping to do a sit-down interview with her running mate, Governor Tim Walls, we're told, in the coming weeks. She says that she hopes that's on the books, certainly by the end of August. But we know that the attention really largely will be on the DNC next week. Gabe. You know, and Monica, one policy we do have from Harris that differs from President Biden is her coming out in favor of Trump's no tax on tips idea. We mentioned that in the intro. What can you tell us about how that came to be? Yeah, and it was interesting today at the White House press briefing, the press secretary was asked whether if that was something, let's say, that was put into legislation, somehow passed and made it to the president's desk, would he, the current commander in chief, support that? And the White House said, yes, this is something that President Biden would be behind, too. But you're right. It's not like he was necessarily rolling that out as a policy platform or proposal when he was the candidate at the top of the ticket. So what the Harris Walls campaign is saying now is that this is something that fits under the umbrella of wanting to to propose things that would help working families and certainly it's no accident that she talked about this in the state of Nevada where this would really benefit the service industry there and they're putting it into that larger context as well Gabe. So they did they copy it from Trump? They're not saying that because they're saying essentially that if it's a good idea, it can be a good idea on its own. They're saying, and in a maybe ironic moment, that if it happens to be something where there's an area of agreement, then that may be one of the only things that the two would agree on. Certainly a very rare agreement. You know, Monica, before I let you go, one person we did hear from over the weekend was President Biden. He talked at length about his decision not to run and his thoughts on Trump. What else did he say? Yeah, and we know that there were going to be these reflective moments from President Biden talking about this. And he had promised to be a sort of transition candidate. And now, of course, he's decided to leave the race altogether. Here's a little bit more of what he had to say in that interview that aired on Sunday. Look, um, the polls we had showed that it was neck and neck race. would have been down to the wire. But what happened was uh, a number of my Democratic colleagues in the House and Senate thought that I was going to hurt them in the races. And I was concerned if I stayed in the race, that would be the topic you'd be interviewing me about. It's a great honor being president. I think I have an obligation to the country to do what I, the most important thing to do, and that is we must, we must, we must defeat Trump. So President Biden really putting that in the context of what maybe people like former Speaker Nancy Pelosi had been talking about for some time before he ultimately made that decision, which was this concern that his decision to stay in the race had he maintained his reelection bid, how that would have really hurt races in the Senate and in the House. And ultimately, that's something the president says did weigh on him to decide the way he went. Okay. Monica Alba, live for us at the White House. Monica, thank you. I want to turn now to Garrett Haig, who, as we said, covers the Trump campaign. So, you know, so Garrett, based on your reporting, has the Harris campaign managed to get under the skin of Donald Trump? I think that's obvious. It's evident from the way he's behaved on social media, the way he's behaved on the campaign trail, and the delta we see from what his campaign says is their plan for taking on Harris going mm -hmm. forward, and the way in which he, the candidate, is choosing to do it. And the, 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 Trump campaign's plan here is to be a little bit of strategic patience to get through the convention. They know that Harris is going to continue this honeymoon, probably get a bump coming out of that, and then try to go after her for her policies, for tying her to Biden and so forth. Donald Trump, I think, is quite clearly cannot wait that long, and he's mm -hmm. trying to use every other opportunity to bring up some other issue. So speaking of opportunities, I want you to shed some light on this because you seem to have as good an insight of, uh, as any into Donald Trump's brain. The <laughs> AI-generated image on the, you know, the allegation that somehow these crowds are AI generated. Mm -hmm. What's he getting at here? 
I don't know that he's getting at anything. I think this is one of those things where crowd size is probably the single most important metric in his mind to, to, to talk about somebody's political strength. And it doesn't compute to him that Harris would have the same ability to draw a crowd that he does. I also think this is a function of the fact that despite the best efforts of this campaign structure, which is better than last campaign structures, nobody's able to stop him from all the incoming he gets, including from some of the most no, this is even far right. It's like not even fair. Like the most outlandish thinkers, let's say, on the Internet still have his number and can, can still get ideas in front of him and from their lips to his Twitter account. Is it possible, though, also that he's doing this as a way to sow doubt within his own followers who are, who are very likely to believe something that he says? And that way, that's a way to blunt the impact of these these large crowds. I think that's possible. And I've seen it written that this is also part of him laying the groundwork for if he could eventually mm -hmm. lose this race. Look, all of a sudden there was all this cheating. You know, this, this is, it harkens back to the whole stop the steal idea here. How could I, Donald Trump, have lost to somebody like Joe Biden? How could I, Donald Trump, have gotten fewer, you know, people at my rallies than somebody like Kamala Harris? Perhaps I didn't, you know? And right. It's almost like a permission structure to doubt what your own eyes are seeing for his most hardcore followers. But I don't think it's that strategic, Gabe. I think that's important to remember. I don't think there's some grand plan about this. A lot of this is just done by feel when it's Trump. All right. So talking about a grand plan tonight, mm -hmm. uh, he is set to be interviewed by Elon Musk. What can you tell me about that? Not known as one of the great interviewers of our time, right. let's say, but he does have an enormous platform and a platform used by the people that the Trump campaign is trying to target. The Trump campaign is not interested necessarily in finding viewers of a program like this one. Mm -hmm. Their strategy hinges in part on activating voters Voters, or perhaps not even voters, but people who could be Trump voters who are often young, male, disaffected from the regular news cycle. A lot of those people are on streaming platforms and on places like Twitter. So it's an opportunity to reach an audience that might not otherwise be paying attention to news. But I got to tell you, it is a total unknown. Obviously, Musk was not always a Trump fan. He is now. Who knows what topics might come up on this? I'm sure the Trump campaign doesn't. Uh, it seems like a high risk you know, open-ended question of the reward. Yeah, certainly high risk because it worked so well for Ron DeSantis. Well, yeah, exactly. Not exactly the, the but I, I will say Musk has said he is pressure testing the systems. He has posted this himself to make sure we don't have at least the technical issues that bedeviled that event. All right, we'll have to see. Gary, yeah, we'll be watching. Thank you so much for joining me here you on bet. set. We really appreciate it. And I want to bring in a couple of our resident experts. Mark Murray is also here, senior political editor here at NBC News and Steve Leisman, senior economics reporter at CNBC. Uh, Mark, I, I do want to start with you. What can you tell me more about this uh, New York Times Siena poll numbers you flagged, the three key swing states? What is so significant about this shift in, in the race? Still within the margin of error, but how, how big a deal is that shift? It's notable because back in May and then even in Pennsylvania in July, you ended up having a situation where Donald Trump was in the lead. Again, within the margin of error, still a very competitive race. But this is just more evidence. This has been a reset contest mm. with Kamala Harris now becoming the Democratic Party's standard bearer. But Gabe, there's actually something even more significant to me in that, uh, in that mm -hmm. poll beyond the horse race numbers, and that is uh, Kamala Harris's favorability numbers. Mm. She has skyrocketed to be actually have a net positive favorability rating. Uh, President Biden, the last poll in, in Pennsylvania, had him at minus 20 net negative rating for him. She's now at plus two in Pennsylvania. And so that's just a marked contest. And what's also notable is that Donald Trump is pretty much at the same position he was in July versus now. And so to me, one of the key indicating points and one of the key questions that we're going to end up having is, do those numbers continue to stand mm. for Harris or do they end up changing after three months? So that favorability bump for Harris, what do you attribute that to? Is she essentially running like a, a generic Democrat or is it that she's not Joe Biden, so that's what's leading to this? What do you make of it? I think a little bit, yes. She is running as that generic Democrat, as Nate Cohn in the New York Times kind of put it. And Gabe, we've actually seen Democratic down-ballot candidates, whether in uh, Ohio, like Sherrod Brown, you end up having John Tester in Montana, uh, you end up having, uh, you know, Tammy Baldwin in Wisconsin. All these Democrats have been outrunning President Biden when mm. he was at the top of the ticket. Now, all of a sudden, you remove President Biden, and Harris is also doing pretty well. Mm. But again, part of being a generic candidate is, you know, your record hasn't been litigated. Mm. You haven't gone through the ringer of opposition research, really bad news environments. And as we know in this kind of campaign world, 
you know, Gabe, you have some good days and you also have some bad days, even for the successful candidates. And Harris has yet to actually, be at the top of the ticket, had a really bad day as a candidate. And that probably will change over the next three months. Yeah, that's right. Mark Murray, thank you so much. I want to bring in uh, Steve uh, Leisman. CNBC has their own poll of swing voters, Steve. Nationwide, you also saw a big disparity between their net approval ratings when it comes to swing voters. So what can you tell us about all that? Yeah, this is a subgroup of our general national poll of a thousand uh, uh, voters uh, nationwide, uh, and, and it represents twenty percent of our poll. So, I just uh, need to know that our, our margin of error is higher for this. It's three point one for the full poll, but seven percent for this uh, subgroup. We represent twenty percent of voters. Interestingly, thirty-one percent of Latinos fall into this group of independents ticket splitters and undecided for president. And what we found is they don't like Donald Trump very much. Uh, we find uh, the uh, approval rating of the net approval rating of uh, Vice President Harris at minus nine. For Trump, it's minus 39. And net approval, of course, is approval minus disapproval. Um, they do give Trump the edge when it comes to who would be best for your financial future, uh, 28 to 8. But look at the percentage there. I don't know if you have it there. That shows um, how uh, how much many don't think it matters at all. To me, this says that it's wide open for either candidate to capture the imagination of the swing voter group. You know, and Steve, I'm going to ask you to put your CNBC hat on. You know, both Harris and Trump have come out for ending taxes on tips. From a policy perspective, though, can you tell us what that would mean and what impacts it would have on the government's bottom line? Well, you know, think about maybe a physicist who gets to witness the birth of a star. As an economics reporter, I'm witnessing, you know, the birth of another part of the budget deficit. That's one way to think about it. You know, yeah. this is how this happens. The, the, uh, the polls on the campaign trail end up uh, making promises and that ends up having, uh, if it becomes law, obviously, um, Tr profound effects, per perhaps as 150 to 200 billion dollars I've seen over a 10 year period on the budget deficit. Other distortions happen because of it. You treat like jobs uh, in different ways from a taxation point of view. It is not a beloved proposal by candidate by, by economists. However, it seems to be perhaps beloved by politicians. And Mark, look, we were talking earlier about Kamala Harris as a generic Democrat. Is she running as a change candidate, even as an incumbent vice president? How is that going to work? How is that really possible? Yeah, Gabe, I mean, she certainly represents change from President Biden, right? right. And so there's like that part of the equation. But outside of the change, the way that I've almost been viewing this presidential contest is who's the, a referendum on? And mm -hmm. from the data that I've actually seen in our poll and others, this was looking to be a referendum on President Joe Biden. You re remove him from the equation, he exits the, the ballot, and all of a sudden now, this looks more like a referendum on Donald Trump than it certainly was before. I think the question is, and we're going to end up seeing the Trump campaign try to litigate Harris and try to turn this back into a referendum on her, but I think that is, to me, the biggest change is that we've gone from a referendum on Biden to more of a referendum on Donald Trump. Okay, and one more question before you go. Um, you, we've been talking about a key voting group for Kamala Harris will be young voters. You, you had your eye on one uh, group of young voters that came here for a deliberative poll. What, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, Gabe, this is a kind of a different poll than we always talk about that Steve and I were talking about when people call you up yeah. and you give them your responses. This is a poll where people actually gather into one hotel mm -hmm. conference room or one uh, mm -hmm. uh, convention area over a three or four day period. And NBC News got to witness this. Our colleague Savannah Sellers is going to have a mm -hmm. piece on this at, on Nightly News tonight. There's mm -hmm. going to be some really interesting polling results. But in the past, these deliberative polls are, you know, America in one room is that when you end up deliberating and talking about issues and even mm -hmm. debating, that you actually become a little bit more moderate in your own right. tone. You respect other people's opinions, even <laughs> ones you might disagree with. <laughs> Completely different from our social media yeah, exactly, that we have seen. But seeing this live and when the results come out, I think it's going to be really fascinating. But some different attitudes that we normally right. have when we put away our phones right. and actually start talking to other people. Face-to-face -face interaction. You don't say, Mark. It's great, Gabe. <laughs> Mark Murray, thank you so much. Thank Steve Leisman as well. We really appreciate your time. And coming up, the Middle East on edge. Israel facing fresh scrutiny for a deadly strike on a school in Gaza where civilians were sheltering as Hezbollah launches dozens of rockets across the Lebanon border. Plus, policy pressure. I'll talk to one of the leaders 
of the uncommitted movement about what the group wants to hear from Vice President Harris about how she would handle the war against Hamas. You're watching Meet the Press Now. Welcome back. International condemnation is pouring in after a deadly strike this weekend on a Gaza City school turned shelter. Israel says the building was being used as a Hamas command center and that militants were hiding inside. In this video from our NBC News team in Gaza, you can see significant damage to that building, rubble and debris covering the ground as people tried to sift through whatever belongings they may have left. The Hamas-run Civil Defense Service in Gaza says at least 100 people were killed in that strike and many more injured. The Israeli military says those figures do not match its numbers and fail to differentiate between combatants and non-combatants. That strike only adding to the growing tensions in the Middle East as the region continues to brace for Iran's retaliatory strike on Israel almost two weeks after the death of Hamas's political leader. And joining me now is Richard Engel, our chief foreign correspondent in northern Israel. Richard, thank you so much for being here. Look, over the weekend, Hezbollah fired rockets into Israel. Could that mean that Iran's retaliation could be imminent? That could mean that. Um, it's not exactly clear that that was uh, related or is related to what could be coming. It might be. It might be a prelude to uh, what this country, what U.S. officials, what regional officials are expecting and expecting uh, quite soon. But there has been an ongoing war, low-level war, between Israel and Hezbollah over the, uh, the Lebanese border, on both sides of the Lebanese border, for the last seven months, but, uh, or since, since the October 7th attacks, I should say. Uh, but what I can tell you is this country is bracing for a much larger uh, attack uh, that could be uh, coming tonight, could come to, uh, tomorrow. The expectations is that it might come in the, within the next 24 hours or so. Uh, a coordinated attack by Hezbollah, Iran, uh, likely involving uh, other Iranian uh, proxies in the region, uh, in Iraq, Syria, Yemen, etc. They, they don't exactly know the scale, and, and that is why you, you're seeing so much action from the U.S. military, so, much, uh, so many preparations being made from, from Israel tonight. Uh, Israel just announced that it's now in its highest state of military alert, highest state of military readiness. Uh, the U.S. military has uh, advanced, deployed uh, a, a squadron of, of F-22s. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it, it announced today that a submarine is being sent to the region. It announced that a, another aircraft carrier's movement is being sped up. So uh, the United States is, is uh, by announcing all of these things, uh, is sending a message of deterrence. By doing them, it is preparing in case uh, whatever does happen here uh, spirals out of control. Um, there is a possibility that we, what we could see uh, follows the same pattern as what happened four months ago, almost exactly four mm -hmm. months ago, when there was an attack on an Iranian diplomatic facility. Iran responded. Most of its uh, missiles were shot down. Israel responded in a fairly symbolic way, and that tit-for-tat was over, contained fairly quickly. But the fact that the U.S. military is moving here in such a major way, which it did, by the way, last time as well, it, it, it expresses the, the level of concern that even if there is a tit-for-tat, perhaps even that tit-for-tat that we saw the early stages of uh, in the last 24 hours in the, in the exchange you, you initially asked me about, yeah. that, that concern that it could spiral out of control. You know, Richard, turning out of the war in Gaza, Hamas said today that one of the hostages was killed by a guard. So what more do we know, and what's the latest on the ceasefire talks? So, uh, first on that announcement by Hamas, uh, what Hamas said specifically, and it was by the military spokesman of the Qassam Brigades, which is the military wing of Hamas, it said that two guards actually in two separate incidents, uh, one killed a male hostage, said that he was killed instantly, and that, uh, by shooting, and that another incident involving a guard that two female hostages were seriously wounded when they were shot, and that Hamas is now acting to give them medical treatment to, quote, save their lives. Uh, and it said that Israel bears responsibility because of the massacres that have been carrying out. It didn't fully explain 
accept responsibility. It didn't say that this was an official Hamas assassination. It, it implied that these were individual actions by two guards and that Hamas was investigating what happened. If that is to be believed, uh, it could have been uh, that they were assassinated. But Hamas did say uh, its version of events is that two guards on their own accord, apparently, uh, killed a male hostage and grievously injured two female hostages. Hamas says it's investigating. The Israeli uh, military, the chief military spokesman, has commented saying that he can neither confirm or deny that they haven't been given any proof about what happened, but that they are also investigating. Richard Engel, live for us in Israel. Richard, thank you for your reporting. And the Biden administration continues to work behind the scenes to try and secure a ceasefire agreement in Gaza. And on the campaign trail, Vice President Harris is also making clear the time for a deal is now. But the war continues to divide Democrats, and Harris is trying to define her foreign policy position in the face of pro-Palestinian protests. Here's what Harris had to say over the weekend after that deadly strike on a school in Gaza. Yet again, there are far too many civilians who have been killed. I mean, Israel has a right to go after the terrorists that are Hamas. But as I have said many, many times, they also have, um, I believe, an important responsibility to avoid civilian casualties. And joining me now is Leila Alabit, co-founder of the Uncommitted Movement. That's a group that encouraged Democrats to vote uncommitted during the Democratic primaries in protest of President Biden's handling of the Israel-Hamas war. Leila, thank you so much for joining us. Look, Vice President Harris's office has made clear that she does not support an arms embargo on Israel. And you spoke with her when she was in Michigan last week. Did you get a sense of what her policy is when it comes to the handling of the war? And do you think her approach will be any different than President Biden's? Yeah, what I seen was that Vice President uh, Harris is um, very empathetic very sympathetic to our movement, to our cause. But right now, that is not enough. That is not enough for Michigan voters, and that is not enough for uncommitted voters. Um, and really, what we need right now is we need Vice President Harris to take a page away from Biden's current policy and use this opportunity to unite this fractured party over a immoral and unpopular Gaza policy. And so right now, voters are, you know, part of uncommitted, um, part of the ceasefire movement are asking and demanding, what are you going to do to earn our votes um, and offer, offer us a more humane, humanitarian policy on the Gaza. And Leila, as you know, the vice president was interrupted by pro-Palestinian protesters during that rally in Detroit. Let me play some of that and get your reaction. I'm here because we believe in democracy. Everyone's voice matters, but I am speaking now. I am speaking now. You know what? If you want Donald Trump to win, then say that, otherwise I'm speaking. Leila, what do you make of that? And what's your response to this idea that these protests are helping Donald Trump? You know, I really wish Vice President Harris's reaction was different and more empathetic and more compassionate, like she was with me when I had the opportunity to engage with her briefly right before she was on the stage of that rally. Um, and for those protesters, those are peaceful protesters who, you know, are using their voice to advocate for human rights. They don't have a multi-million dollar super PAC to advocate for them. And they are there at that rally to signal to Vice President Harris that we are Democratic voters. Um, we are voters in your camp and we want you to, you know, we want you to earn our votes and we want to know how you will earn those votes. You know, and later, earlier this year when we saw those protests on college campuses, Trump has said that he would want to deport international students involved in those demonstrations. So, look, his policies don't appear any more palpable. Um, I want to ask you a question that I asked some of the voters that I spoke with in, in Michigan last week, and I've been speaking with them over the last uh, several months, is that 
Do you view this as having to vote for the lesser of two evils, uh, perhaps, when it comes to Vice President Harris? And for those in your, your organization or your movement, if you vote third party, is that not handing the election to Donald Trump? And right now, our movement is about pushing the Democratic Party, pushing Vice President Harris to offer our voters, Democratic voters, a more humane policy on La Gaza. Um, that's why we're not advocating for third party. That is why, you know, folks, protesters at that rally were at a Harris rally, not a Trump rally. Um, saying, you know, listen to our voices, listen to our demands. We need a better policy so we can get behind you um, in November so we can combat another four years of a Trump policy. And Layla, Democrats will gather for the convention in Chicago next week, of course. What does the uncommitted movement plan to do with its delegates? And will anyone from your movement get any speaking time? Uncommitted delegates going into the DNC are representing anti-war voters, um, and they will be there to ensure that their voices will be heard. Um, we have demanded that we have speaking time for our uncommitted delegates and for our uncommitted leaders, as well as civil servants who have been on the front lines in Gaza, um, like Dr. Tanya Hajj Hassan, who is a renowned uh, pediatric physician, intensive uh, a pediatric intensive care physician, who can speak to the very human impact of our U.S. policy decision. So, Leila, you've asked for speaking time. Have you gotten any speaking time yet? We haven't received, um, you know, if if uncommitted leaders or Dr. Tanya Hajj Hassan will receive that speaking time that we've demanded. So you you don't know yet, or a week we out. Don't know yet. Okay. Yeah, we're is a week that, out, we don't know yet. Is that troubling but, to you that you haven't been told any of the plans yet? Um, you know, it it is, we are hoping because these are Democrats, these are delegates under the Democratic Party, we will respect the proceedings of the DNC, but our voices will be heard nonetheless. Layla Alabin with the Uncommitted Movement. Thank you so much for your time. I really Thank appreciate you so it. Much for having me. Thank you. Yeah. And up next, the Trump campaign says it was hacked and suggests Iran was to blame. We'll dig into what we know and what we don't know about the incident and what it could mean for future attempts to meddle in the 2024 presidential election. You're watching Meet the Press now. Stay with us. And welcome back. Just breaking moments ago, the FBI announced that it was investigating what the Trump campaign is describing as a hack of its computer networks. Investigators are not characterizing what happened, but the campaign is pointing the finger at Iran. The hack was first reported by Politico, which says it began receiving internal Trump documents from an anonymous account calling itself Robert in July. The New York Times says it also received similar, if not identical, documents from the same purported person. NBC News has not been able to verify that the hack took place or who was responsible. According to Politico, the documents it received included insider information on at least two of the potential Trump running mates, including Senator J.D. Vance. And with me now is Suzanne Spaulding, who led the Department of Homeland Security's cybersecurity operations under President Obama, and she is now an advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Suzanne, thank you so much for joining us. And if this, if, and that's a big if, if this was Iran, what are Tehran's main goals from this hack? Yeah, um, and thank you for the qualifier, because there's still a lot we don't know. But we do know that Iran has been engaged for at least the last three election cycles in efforts to influence our political discourse uh, and to interfere in our elections. Um, they have uh, a, a broad goal of sowing chaos in this country to make us weak so that we can't mobilize uh, to meet the security challenges that Iran uh, may, may, may present to us. They have a goal of exacerbating the divisions within our country the, the, around issues that are already uh, polarizing in our society to exacerbate those and amplify them. Uh, and they are focused on swing states. We know that. Uh, and the intelligence community, as of July, uh, has assessed that they have an intent mm -hmm. 
to harm the Trump campaign. So this alleged hack at this point, it has disseminated information, or at least, you know, these news organizations got some of these uh, supposed internal documents. But what type of information could the actors here obtain from this type of hack? Well, certainly sensitive internal documents uh, of the campaign. The, the, the concern about these vetting documents, of course, is that vetting documents typically have both the positive and all of the negative. The concern, of the uh, intention of vetting is to, uh, is to find out whatever skeletons may be in someone's closet, whatever negative things might be out there that might be a vulnerability to the campaign. So these documents would contain that kind of information. The Trump campaign is saying that the documents, whatever's in there, is already out in the public domain, and that may be the case. But there are sensitive campaign documents about campaign strategy, what they intend to do in the future that could be uh, sensitive. And of course, campaigns need to understand that they are the targets not only of adversary nation states, which they are at all levels, um, but also of hacktivists and of ordinary criminals. They have a lot of sensitive personal information as well. And Suzanne, from a cybersecurity standpoint, which country poses the most imminent threat to U.S. elections? Well, Russia has traditionally been both the most capable and the most determined. And interestingly, the uh, you know intelligence community and as well as Microsoft and other experts looking at this have said that they haven't seen so far uh, a lot of activity as much as we expect to see from Russia, um, but they are cautioning that we should very much uh, expect them to get involved. And it makes sense. Think about how uh, sort of existential this election may seem to Vladimir Putin with regard particularly to the issue of su our support for Ukraine. So they, they will not stand on the sidelines. They are already getting engaged in influence operations around Ukraine. And we expect, we should expect to see direct influence uh, interference in our election. What about China or other countries? So the assessment from China is that uh, China hasn't chosen a candidate and, and is unlikely to uh, in this campaign. Uh, both candidates are pretty hard charging with three, when it comes to China. But China shares the same interests that Russia and Iran have in undermining our democracy and weakening us, undermining the public's trust in democracy and in our democratic institutions. And they are very much engaged in campaigns around uh, divisive issues in our country. And there's also a sense that they may get involved in more uh, local, state and local campaigns where there are particular issues of interest to them. Suzanne Spaulding, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. And coming up, abortion and the election. Now, the former President Trump recently suggested that he's open to banning a key drug for medication, abortion. His VP pick is now trying to walk that back. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. J.D. Vance is walking back Donald Trump's recent suggestion that he'd be open to banning access to the abortion medication mefepristone. Well, President Trump won the nomination of the Republican Party. He said it to you, and he said it repeatedly, that his goal is not to block mifepristone. It's to let states make the decision on abortion policy. Last week, when Mr. Trump was asked directly by NBC's Garrett Haake whether he would direct the FDA to revoke access to mifepristone, the former president did not rule out banning the widely used abortion pill. Well, I'm joined now by the panel, Peter Baker. New York Times chief White House correspondent and NBC News political analyst, Amisha Cross, Democratic strategist and former Obama campaign advisor, and Rodney Davis, former Republican congressman from Illinois. Thank you all for, for joining me. Rodney, I want to start with you. Did J.D. Vance succeed in cleaning up any potential mess by Donald Trump's comments last week? Well, Vice, you know, Vice Presidential Candidate Vance did the best he could to go back to the Republican platform which irked many pro-life groups here in Washington, D.C., because it was not the same strong pro-life language that many of us have been used to. Mm -hmm. So I think the Trump-Vance campaign is trying to have it both ways and keep those pro-life groups appeased, but at the same time um, address an issue that it's important to many Americans. Do you think the Trump message of, oh, I'm going to leave this to the states, do you think that that message is working for, you know, conservatives 
Yeah, for, for conservatives, do you think it is working? Oh, for conservatives, they're going to vote for Donald Trump. I mean, the, no it's a binary choice between Donald Trump, who gave us the most conservative Supreme Court in our generation, or you've got Vice President Harris. You know, Peter, uh, we were talking earlier in the program. Do you think that at this point, the Harris campaign is getting under Donald Trump's skin? <laughs> um, it looks like it. I mean, this, the crowd size thing would indicate yeah. that, right? Nothing matters more, it seems, at times to President, former President Trump than crowd size, and he seems fixated on hers and says she only gets 1,000, and she's, that, that some of these crowds are just mm -hmm. generated by artificial intelligence, which obviously is not true. Um, and I hear from his people, obviously, they would like him to be more disciplined about his attack on her. He's got a lot of things he wants to say or could say about her on the border, or on inflation, on other issues. But he's, he's fixated on things like crowd size, and they're getting under his skin a little bit, which is, I think, a different way of approaching it. Biden wasn't very good at that. So, Misha, heading into the DNC next week, what type of bump do you think that Kamala Harris could get from the Democratic National Convention? Or has she peaked at this point? I don't think that there is a peak for Kamala Harris. Um, 24 hours after the announcement, we saw sizable excitement around her across the nation in various places that, honestly, members of the community were thinking they would sit out the 2024 presidential election. I think that with the DNC, it's going to be star-studded. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be a vision for the future. It's going to do that whole bring back joy conversation. There may be a Beyonce appearance. Who knows? Um, but I think that as we move closer to it, we're seeing more and more Democratic groups coalesce. We're also going to see, you know, the assemblage of the former Democratic presidents who all come in alignment with her as well, who each of them has their own demographic that they are also going to be helping to bring back under that tent. I think that this shows no signs of stopping and that anybody who thinks that this is a honeymoon is going to be proven wrong. Why not do a sit down interview before the DNC? I think that a sit-down interview is coming. Um, at this point, what is, she's, she's only been here. She's only been the nominee for how many days? And we're talking about the virtual nomination. She hasn't she hasn't been through the DNC yet. Yeah, it will more than likely come after the DNC. But she's also doing what people are asking her to do, meet them where they are. She's having those conversations in battleground states. She's also going to lay out policy plans and proposals. People have been waiting to see that. That's what's most important right now. Press conference doesn't take that long, though. And, and it won't take that long after the DNC either. I mean, but I'm just saying. All right, well, Rodney, what do you make of Donald Trump peddling this conspiracy theory that somehow President Biden is going to waltz back into the DNC and going to ask for the nomination back somehow? Where is that coming from? Uh, it's coming from his own mind and mm -hmm. wishful thinking, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, but at this point, going back to, to Vice President Harris, um, she won't sit down for an interview, as most Americans are witnessing right now. She's been vice president for three and a half years. She was a U.S. senator before that, the attorney general of California, sitting down at a press conference or standing up at a press conference and answering simple questions should be like a Tuesday morning coffee. But clearly, she does not want to do that. You know, it's a valid point. The counterpoint to that is, OK, well, Donald Trump organized the press conference very quickly last week. He spoke for more than an hour. He took a lot of questions. He also put out a lot of falsehoods. So what is that really beneficial? I mean, yes, he took questions, but it was it was a rambling press conference. So I don't think anybody around this table would tell us that Kamala Harris is going to want to follow what Donald Trump does. <laughs> but maybe she ought to take that as an opportunity to do her own get her facts straight, answer the tough questions without mm -hmm. spewing out the word salads that Americans have been used to when she has done that in the past. She's going where the value is, and the value for her right now is in the battleground stage. She's going where she needs to lay out her plan. She's going where she needs to introduce herself to the American public. Her value add here is making sure that she's reaching people who don't watch traditional news, who aren't reading traditional news. Unfortunately, even though all of us are around this table right now, the overwhelming majority of the American public is not people who are buying into traditional news anymore. So she's making sure that she's meeting the people where they are. Look, the, the, the issue is maybe not just reaching voters, but Peter, I, I want to get your thoughts on this. Wasn't the knock on President Biden that he didn't do enough news yes. conferences, didn't do enough interviews, and then, oh, all of a sudden we got to the debate and so much of America was surprised yeah. that he, you know, collapsed in yeah. the debate. What is your, you know, is the same thing not in a way happening with Kamala Harris by refusing to bring around in front of the reporters as a member of the White House Press Corps. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, look, there are two reasons why uh, press conferences are, and interviews are useful for a president or presidential candidate. One, of course, is because democracy does, you know, demand the idea that a candidate have to answer what they stand for and, t and stand up tough questions before an election so that voters can make up their mind in a fully informed way. Secondly, it actually gives them 
practice, right? It does give them an, an opportunity to present their case, to handle the tough questions, to learn how to uh, clean up their mistakes when they do make them, because they do make them. Now, remember, Kamala Harris had a terrible interview, at least in her view, with Lester Holt in her first year as vice president, and it stung her for a long time because she gave an answer on the border that seemed um, maladroit, let's say. Mm -hmm. And she kind of went into a bunker for about a year mm -hmm. or so without giving more interviews because she seemed so... Um, disturbed by that. So she doesn't feel like she has, mm -hmm. uh, you know, she's got a bad history there. Having said that, she can do good interviews. Her interview with Anderson Cooper after the debate, right. she did far better than President Biden did that night. A lot right. of people noticed that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, our argument would be and, give interviews. And at the time, our reporting suggested that she really wanted to do that. They considered pulling her uh, yeah. from that interview. Rodney, um, um, Peter brought up uh, immigration, brought up the border. Look, Kamala Harris is talking more about the border these days, trying to hit the message that it was Donald Trump that sunk that bipartisan border bill. Immigration in the economy, voters trust Donald Trump, according to polls, more than Kamala Harris. Yet, these latest around the polls has her leading within the margin of error in these battleground states. Is that a huge red flag for the Donald Trump campaign, despite voters trusting him on these two main issues? Now, the race is so close, and actually, she may be pulling ahead here. It, it, it's not a huge red flag, but it's a red flag. And it should be a red flag that the campaign team in, in Florida waves in his face that says, get back to being disciplined like you were during the Republican convention. And then the American people will put faith in you and your policies to address the economy and the immigration much better than Vice President Harris. And we're running low on time here, but um, I wanna, Misha, I wanna bring you in. In terms of favorability, those polls that we were um, just looking at right now, her favorability has increased significantly. Has she done anything to actually deserve that or is she just not President Biden at this point? I think there are a little bit of two things. Um, she's got it on the campaign trail. We saw the coalescing around her immediately amongst multiple demographics. But beyond that, Americans really didn't want a Biden-Trump mm. race again. So I think that some of it is reflective of that. The other part is she's come out as a superstar in a very short amount of time. The people needed to see her. That's a very hard task when you're vice president and your role is to be number two. Peter, I want to end with you. Is this the first time that you can remember that a sitting vice president is running as the change candidate? <laughs> well, it is an odd uh, position to be in, right? But that's clearly what she's trying to be. She's trying mm -hmm. to say, we're not going back. Well, not going back, you know, you've been in for four years. But compared to a 78-year-old former president, she at least has the plausible uh, case to make, right? That she mm -hmm. can make a generational argument that they couldn't make when it was President Biden at 81. And she's trying the future, and he's and she's going to try to make him in the past. And the challenge for him is to get past the golden oldies. I think the press conference last week felt like we've heard all these before. All these are comments and quotes. We've heard them all before, most of them. And he needs to figure out a way. How does he present himself as a change agent? Because he is an agent of disruption at the very least, uh, and he needs to pre present that as a as an appealing uh, idea to, to voters. Peter, Rodney, Amisha, thank you so much for joining me here on the panel. And still to come. For the first time, President Zelensky addresses Ukraine's surprise incursion into Russian territory as fighting ramps up on the front lines. You're watching Meet the Press now. Stay with us. Welcome back. It's been almost a week since Ukrainian troops launched their unprecedented incursion into Russian territory. In a video statement, President Zelensky is now thanking a number of Ukrainian battalions, including troops who were pushing the war into, quote, the aggressor's territory. Ukraine's military estimates it now controls about 1,000 square kilometers or almost 400 square miles of Russian territory. Joining me now is NBC News international correspondent Josh Letterman. Josh, thank you so much for being here. What more do we know about this unprecedented ex incursion by the Ukrainian forces? And has this offensive into Russia had an impact on morale for both Ukrainian troops and for the Ukrainian people more broadly. Well, Gabe, for the first several days of this incursion, the Ukrainian government was not even acknowledging that they were behind it. Now they're kind of flaunting it, kind of throwing it in President Putin's face with those comments from President Zelensky, uh, as well as from the military claiming uh, that they've taken over some 385 square miles. Now, NBC can't independently verify those numbers on the ground uh, on the Ukrainian-Russian border. But suffice it to say, this has been a major shock and an embarrassment to President Putin. 
Putin, who's now responding uh, with a lot of vitriol. He says that retaliation will be coming, that the first order of business really is to try to squeeze Ukraine out of the territory that it has now taken over. Uh, but now you have Ukrainians really bracing for potentially massive retaliation that could potentially include uh, waves of hundreds of missiles and rockets launched at uh, Ukraine. We've seen Russia do that before when Ukraine has struck really key strategic points uh, such as the Crimean Bridge and other points uh, in Crimea. Uh, and the question is, when is that retaliation come? What is it going to look like? The Ukrainian SBU, their intelligence service, now warning that the Russians may try to do a false flag operation against the residents, the Russians in Kursk, this region in Russia, so that they can then blame it on Ukraine. And if things could not get worse, we now have this additional concern inside Ukraine at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, the largest in Europe, where there has been a large fire raising concerns about safety there. President Zelensky blaming that fire on Russians, but of course the Russian government, they're blaming the Ukrainians, Gabe. Josh Letterman, thank you so much. And thank you for watching. I'm Gabe Gutierrez, and I'll be back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. The news continues with Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.